It is Friday, so it is time for our book and other stuff club. And tonight we wanted to talk about failure with the host of a popular UK podcast, How to Fail. In the podcast, which has ironically been a huge success, the host Elizabeth Day requires high-profile guests to confess to and discuss at some length three personal failures. Ouch. Take Malcolm Gladwell, New York staff writer and best-selling author, his damning realisation that he'd pulled away from a charismatic, witty friend once he discovered she was an alcoholic. Listen for Elizabeth Day's devastating follow-up question. And it was almost as if she had become someone else. And this is an indefensible position, but I think it's almost as if I said, well, I'm not friends with that person. I was friends with the old person, the indomitable one. It's really no different from being in love with someone when they're attractive and falling out of love when they become old and unattractive. Are you fearful that your other friendships are also that? Well, of course. Oh, <laughs> then there's f devastating Phoebe Waller-Bridge, writer and star of the hit series Fleabag, there she is, on her own excruciating dating failures. Now, imagine the scene the morning after an awkward encounter, trying to exit politely, humming a little tune. A song that I really love is Etta James's At Last. I was walking down the stairs and I was singing at last, <laughs> all the way down the stairs. And like, my love has come along. <laughs> and the, when we got to the bottom stairs, he was like ashen faced and like shaking. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he was like, um, I didn't realize this had meant so much to you. I was like, oh God, no, God, no, no. No, no. Elizabeth Day joins me now from London. Elizabeth. What you do to people, what you make them confess to you, you naughty woman. Thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for telling me my follow-up question to Malcolm Gladwell. It was devastating. Was, I like that. It was <laughs> terrible. It was terrible. I was floored by it. Um, what led you to this point? I mean, you've had a hugely successful career and, gosh, you've done a podcast about failure and even that's been hugely successful. You can't even pull that off. A, on paper, a ridiculously successful person. What are you doing? It's nauseating, isn't it? No. Um, that, well, thank you for the compliment inherent in the question. Um, the, the short answer is, is that I got dumped and that was the launch pad for the podcast. And I got dumped three weeks before my 39th birthday. And when I looked back on the decade of my 30s, I realised that they had been 10 years of intense transition. And while you rightly say I had had some professional success, um, I was a star feature writer on a national newspaper and I'd written a couple of books. Personally, my life had not gone according to plan. So I got married, I got divorced, I tried and failed to have children. I had unsuccessful fertility treatment, I had miscarriages. And then I, a new relationship had ended and I was left staring down the barrel of my 40s thinking, hang on a second, this is not the life that I expected for myself and what went wrong? Um, because I felt like I was a good girl and that I had done, you know, I had worked hard and I had got the right exam results. and. And how come, personally, I hadn't got where I wanted to be? And I started talking to friends about it. And, and it was really that, actually, that in those conversations with friends, I realised that every single time I had failed, I had also, as a result of it, grown stronger and grown to know myself a bit better, which meant, hopefully, I would make better choices in the future. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we opened up this conversation to a more public platform? And at first I thought that perhaps... The, um... I was, I was fascinated that it resonated so much, this podcast, because actually at some level, you know, our first grade teacher told us, didn't she, that our mistakes would make us stronger. But you seem to be exploring in a way that um, you're inviting people to expose these vulnerabilities and there seems to be not just a prurient element in it, and there isn't, I'm sorry, but there's an almost an ethical element to what it does to a person to in, really engage with that vulnerability. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was also, to be quite honest, really surprised with the success of the podcast and the yearning that people clearly had to talk about vulnerability. And while it might seem obvious to say, you know, you can learn from your failures and mistakes can be redrafted as lessons. Actually, I think we live in a culture right now where there is vanishingly little space to talk about that because it feels as though we live in a culture of curated perfection where you are only ever as good as your last Instagram post and you are constantly 
comparing what you know to be your interior monologue with everyone else's exterior lives. And that's never going to be a healthy comparison. And at the same time as that's happening, social media, which in many ways has been a force for good, but as you were just talking about with Donald Trump, social media means that if you send out an ill thought tweet one day, you could lose your job the next. And so at precisely this moment where we're being encouraged to be- Unless you're Donald self, Trump. Unless you're Donald Trump. <laughs> Unless you're Donald Trump. <laughs> Sorry, Donald just for Trump. clarity. Yeah. 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 Um, but, but at precisely the moment that we're being encouraged to be our perfect selves, we also feel hamstrung by the public possibility of shame when we fail. So there's very little space for it. And I think that's what people respond to, that they are really willing to go there when they come to record with me, which is wonderful for me as an interviewer. Yeah. I want to talk to uh, Kurt. I mean, everybody has been watching this Netflix documentary, The Last Dance, right? So we're following the Chicago Bulls, uh, famous team, trying to get that famous sixth NBA title in 1998. And Michael Jordan is at the centre of it all. And I, as I'm watching him, I'm liking him less and respecting him more, right? Because he's pushing everyone harder and harder and refusing even to countenance this notion of failure. And just have a little look from the documentary to start with. What time is it? Time. Our mentality was to go out and win at any cost. Jordan is the most talented player in the NBA by far. Michael didn't allow what he couldn't control to get inside his head. He would say, why would I think about missing a shot I haven't taken yet? Is that you, Kurt? Forget about this how to fail malarkey, there's only winning. <laughs> Look, I think that part of that whole failure thing, it's, um, it takes a certain way to, to see failure to address an athlete. So this idea of that you fail every shot you don't take, yeah. that's like, that's assumed knowledge. That's gravity to, to, to an athlete. That is, the, that is the building blocks of, that is the, like, a, what, pi equals 3.14 or something to a mathematician. You have to to buy into that. So, so you've won, what, what three is? Olympic medals, two Commonwealth medals, you've won 30, more than 30 marathons. Never at any point were you in bed the night before thinking, geez, what if I stuff this up? Oh, no. What I, what, I, what I would say that whenever I was nervous, whenever I would start to feel anxiety about going in front of 100,000 people, I would say that the, the only failure of me would be not starting the next day. Uh, you, get to, you get to lay out the context in sport, which is one of the beautiful things that I love about sport, or many things, is that you get to reframe that moment and you get to create the playing field the night before and lay down the terms of what is success and what is failure. And you might say, what, what the unique thing about Jordan was, was that athletes can say, failure would not be taking the court. Success would be playing to the best of my ability. You know, and along that, along that scale, Jordan's was f failure would be not being the best human on the court every second of yeah. every moment. Yeah. Uh, it was like hearing Luke Longley speak about him. And he said that uh, at, in, in Luke's, in Luke's uh, career, who played for three seasons with Michael, he was at his best good in three out of four matches. He said Michael was great every minute of every day. He was a predator who was just stalking the lines of a basketball court, looking for prey in oh. the opposition to just devour. <laughs> he was a monster. Elizabeth, would you like to get uh, Michael Jordan in front of the microphone? He would be my dream guest, along with Kurt, having just heard that. I'm so inspired <laughs> by that. Look out, <laughs> Kurt. I, I, I don't think Kurt Fernley <laughs> has three failures, but, hey, you could ask. You could ask. <laughs> I do think it's interesting have, what Kurt I... was identifying. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Kurt. <laughs> I, I have plenty of failures, plenty, plenty, plenty. But you you change the context of them, and it's like the old again in the in the DNA of an athlete. While there's blood pumping through the veins, yeah. you know you still get to re reassess that and, and rehash that. And Elizabeth, the th you and I were talking last night. The the moment of vulnerability for Jordan was he was moved to tears in the documentary when actually it was brought home to him that 
the people that he'd worked alongside his teammates actually thought he... I'm trying to think of a polite word. What did they think of him? <laughs> they he wasn't like that nice? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, first of all, I love that we're talking about The Last Dance because it's one of the best things I've seen in lockdown. Um, and I do think that's really interesting because for Michael Jordan, he believed that playing to win and, and success was equivalent to being a good person. And I think during that moment in the documentary where it's revealed that his teammates didn't think he was that nice, is the only time he wells up during the course of that 10 episode Netflix documentary. And I found that fascinating because in his head, as Kurt has rightly identified, he has a different context for success and failure. And, and, and for him, it's completely equivalent to being a good person. Whereas what I've learned during the podcast is that whilst athletes might have a very specific um, use for failure as kind of data acquisition, uh, for me, what I've realized is that I've, in my personal life, redefined success so that I realize now that for me, success is being able to be my authentic self and bring yeah. my whole self into everything that I do. Yeah. And people have very different contexts for it. Claire, I'm going to embarrass you now. You are no. ridiculously young and ridiculously successful and you seem to have had a straight line out of Tasmania, first in family to attend university, and you're on this stellar trajectory, this journalistic career in Canberra, and we sat around the office and we kept hearing these sharp, clever questions at press conferences and kept going, who is that? And finally somebody said, you know, that's Claire Armstrong, you've got to get her on the show, right? So are you at all acquainted with failure? Uh, I would say yes, constantly, mostly uh, every day in my own <laughs> head, probably more than most. Uh, thank you for the compliment. I did not know that was coming, so <laughs> that's really put me on the spot. Uh, I, I would say for me, maybe the reverse, that success is often for me just meeting the moment every day and I try not to say no to too many opportunities, which is how I've somewhat, uh, yeah, found myself in Canberra sometimes asking the Prime Minister questions he might not appreciate uh, in the moment uh, at the, yes, tender age of 27. So in terms of failure, though, I, I think that sometimes it's not uh, so much that I've outright failed or that particularly I think for a lot of young people in the early stages of their career, they're not thinking about, you know, ultimately the the final product being failure but it's more about it being constantly critical of whether the success is what you were aiming for and, in, and intending you often have a really idolized version of what you're hoping to achieve and it's really hard if you have to adjust that goal halfway through um, more and more now I think a lot of young people they have a pretty straight plan to go from high school to university to have a career and we face really uncertain times. I mean, I look around at my workplace and, and in the last few days, upward of possibly a thousand of the yeah. people that I work with are losing their jobs. And I don't think that they're failures. I don't think they did any better or worse than, than I have done. And sometimes for me, failing or avoiding failure is about just reconciling almost uh, a survivor's guilt, particularly in this industry, yeah. of taking those successes and opportunities on board and trying not to waste them, yeah. to make the most mm. of them for, for the people that don't get that opportunity. Ben Abbott Angelo, um, when I first met you, you were working with the Australian Indigenous Mentoring Experience and, and they talk about unlocking the internal narrative of marginalised kids taking them from a world where it tells them they can't to a world that tells them they can. But I wonder whether in doing that you start to think about that failing means different things to different people depending on when they come from, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's an important, um, important thing to note, Alan, that you know, from the moment we're conceived into the womb, there's a bunch of permeating stereotypes and archetypes that when we get born into the world, um, we're forced to take on and then make them our own. So I think there's a lot of, um, everyone's at a different starting point. Not everyone's running in the same lane in the same race. And, you know, I think we live in a society that allows certain people to fail forward. Um, and what does that mean, fail forward? Um, just because Claire spoke about asking the Prime Minister um, uncomfortable questions, I think um, 
he is a person that didn't necessarily knock out of the park a mid-team marketing role. Um, I don't think he knocked out of the park ministerial duties before he became the Prime Minister. I don't think he's knocked um, too much more out of the park once he's been in the office. And it appears from where I sit um, as a civilian in Australia uh, that he's given more opportunities to fumble and fail consistently and still find himself in one of the most powerful positions in the country. And so, and so a lot of... comparatively then, what's failing back... If some people fail forwards like that, in other words, succeed when you reckon they oughtn't, what's failing backwards then? Well, I think there's, um, there's groups of people, Alan, that are born into the world and a society that tells them they're a failure. Um, we've just spoken about what's happening in Minneapolis uh, over in the US. We've spoken about Ken Wyatt um, being unable to push forward the notion of reconciliation. Um, for Aboriginal people here in Australia, we've had shame and this stigma placed upon us uh, for 250 years. Um, we've been plummeted into poverty. People have expropriated um, us from our lands. Uh, and so you, you, say, taken... you say, therefore, there's a risk of a failure is a much more permanent state of affairs, uh, potentially for an Indigenous person in Australia, than it might be for um, a, a politician or, or somebody who maybe steals something in corporate Australia and begs forgiveness and is on the next board that comes along. Well, as a young Indigenous kid, if you're the only Aboriginal kid in your class and you put your hand up and you go out on a limb and you get the question wrong um, and everyone looks at you like, you know, you're that kid, get back in the corner, suddenly your world starts to implode um, right in front of your eyes. Mm. So I think there's, um, mm. yeah, there's, there's people that are given a leap forward um, and are given a safety net. Uh, if they get a fine, if they do something wrong with the law enforcement, their mum or dad can call a lawyer or call the local police station and get them off. Mm. Um, if you come from a marginalised community uh, that has been behind the pack for a couple of hundred years, I don't think you're given that same safety net. Last question. Let me have you, uh, give you a turn, Catherine. Just, we're nearly out of time here. Gosh, you've got us thinking, Elizabeth, haven't you? Is, yeah. there, is there time? Do, is there, do you think, do you sometimes look around at your friends and maybe they've decided at the age of, I don't know, older friends, 70, 75, oh, gosh, I've made the wrong decisions, I've, I've valued the wrong things and it's too late to do anything about that? It's never too late. It's never too late. So, I mean, I think, I think that Ben's comments were absolutely right. There's a difference between what, what effectively is systemic failure, where you are entirely pushed down all the time. It's very hard to rise above yes. that. There's the other side of failure, which is falling down, getting back up again, and then thinking it through, how did it happen, and having and developing insight and resilience. Mm. And I think the key, if I could do anything for all the children in Australia, it would be to develop resilience. Mm. Because it's about being down in the mud and then going, oh, bloody hell, let's <laughs> get out of this one. How do we get here? And, and, and just moving forward. But that's a really white, middle-class view. Yeah. And you have to understand, as Ben said, the young Aboriginal students don't necessarily get that. And those young men and women and the young people that are rioting in Minneapolis, they are absolutely behind mm. the eight ball in what is becoming a failed nation state. Yeah, wow. Elizabeth, you sure have got us talking. I'm so sorry we've run you out of time. Thank you so much for inspiring a conversation about How to Fail. Very interesting, as is your podcast, How to Fail, and your book of the same name. Lovely Thank you it. so much, Elizabeth.